Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, liebe Freunde des Ambos Studientelegramms, Markus at Home welcomes Professor Wilfried Mullens in Genk, Belgium, with whom we would like to discuss diuretic treatment in decompensated heart failure, focusing on the use of acetazolamide. Professor Mullens is a heart failure and cardiac device specialist, again in Genk, in Limburg, Belgium, and board member of the European Society of Cardiology's Heart Failure Association, whose position statement on the use of diuretics in heart failure with congestion he has drafted as first author. A few weeks ago, he presented his advert trial, which tested for the first time in a large patient cohort the use of acetazolamide in decompensated heart failure. The paper has been published simultaneously in the New England Journal of Medicine. My comoreders are from Markus at Home, Markus Seemann, president of the Austrian Society of Nephrology, and both of us are very happy to have for the second time on Markus at Home, Professor Beck de Silva from Porto Alegre, Brazil, who has published last year another randomized controlled trial on an alternative treatment strategy and heart failure decompensation, namely the use of thiazides in addition to loop diuretics. So thanks again for being with us. And it's a pleasure to have you tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I think uh, it's the same as for Dr. De Silva. Uh, I'm going to try to guide you within the next 30 minutes about how we feel you should be using diuretic therapy in heart failure. Uh, of course, I'm going to show you a lot of research. Um, I have to be humble. Most, if not all of research has been done by my PhD fellows. And I am or was very fortunate that I have very talented ones, both women and men, who are really supporting a lot of research in my center. <clears throat> I think the first thing is that we have to consider that residual congestion in our heart failure patients is present and that is linked to poor outcomes. And we often underappreciate the risk that our patients have to die or to be hospitalized. The risk goes up to 20% at two years in ambulatory patients with heart failure and it goes up to 60% at one year, especially if we send our patients home with ongoing congestion. So congestion is a key therapeutic target to prevent further deterioration in heart failure. That's also the reason why we put in the guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology and the Heart Failure Guidelines that we have to treat congestion aggressively before we discharge patients home. This has been uh, recognized already for more than 30 years. This was a Greg Fonero's most, I think, I feel most important contribution to the field, where he proved that reduction in left sided filling pressures is more important than an improvement in cardiac outputs to prevent further mortality. When you look at the kidney, I don't have to explain to you, you're all nephrologists, the kidney gets a tremendous amount of blood, one liter per minute equal to 600 pieces of renal plasma flow. So it's not a surprise that central hemodynamics also play a role in normal kidney function. We and others have shown that an increased central venous pressure is more important than a low cardiac output to um, further deteriorate renal function. Also an increased central venous pressure contributes to more sodium retention. So again, treating congestion on the right side is also very important to prevent further heart failure decompensations. Uh, an elevated central venous pressure is really dangerous. We did a small animal experiment in where we did a selective ligation, partial ligation of the vena cava inferior. And already after a couple of weeks, we saw irreversible changes in the glomeruli of these reds. So having an elevated central venous pressure is not a good thing. It's not something that your kidneys like to deal with. And that's why it's important that we have to try to prevent CKD. And CKD is very prevalent in heart failure. Almost half of our patients have CKD. It's associated with the doubling of risk for all cause mortality, and it's a more stronger predictor than ejection fraction. So you better have a, a higher GFR and a lower ejection fraction than a lower uh, GFR and a higher ejection fraction. So CKD is the most important prognosticator for our heart failure patients. That's why it's so important that we try to prevent further deterioration. And the only drugs that we're having in heart failure patients to prevent further CKD is 
SGLT2 inhibition and RAS inhibition, namely with RNA and so basically succubitril sartum, succubitril valsartum. So those are the two agents that we have in heart failure patients to lower down the decline of CKD. Now, when you look at acute heart failure, I think one of the problems is our unnatural craving for sodium. If I force one of my heart failure caregivers to eat a tablespoon of sodium, they don't like it. And I don't like it either. It's absolutely disgusting because our bodies don't really like sodium. One of the reasons is that we have a very RAS high RAS activity and we're trying to retain all the sodium that we actually eat. So we cannot lose sodium in our guts. The reason for that is that we're upstanding. So we have to have a high blood pressure. So we need to take in or absorb all the sodium that we can eat because historically, of course, we did not have access to sodium. Now, if you think about it, and you would eat one tablespoon of sodium every day, you could see that you're gonna excrete more sodium, but you'll also have a positive sodium balance. That means that after one week, you'll have more sodium in your bodies than what you have now. This is of course exaggerated if you have heart failure, but it's also present in normal human people. So in people without heart failure, without CKD, they too <clears throat> develop a positive sodium balance. So that made me wonder a couple of years ago, where is the sodium hiding? We therefore have buffers that can actually accommodate its excess of sodium and we can take away the sodium in case we would need it. We postulated this, these buffers to be in the glycosamine and glycans. glycans. Uh, this is, the, this is a pivotal work done by Jens Tietze, which you're all familiar with living in the States. But we also examined these gag stores in heart failure patients. And what we did is we did skin biopsies in normal human beings, including my leg, but also in heart failure people. And we could show similar findings like Tietze has shown that you have an increased gag activity in heart failure patients and that you have more RAS activation in the skin of heart failure patients. You know, when you look at the kidney, when we're actually eating or drinking sodium, we get more thirsty, we get an increase in ADH and a reduction in RAS activity. And many of my colleagues think that the problem in the kidney is the filter. Now, if you look at the normal kidney, it filters about one kilogram of sodium every day because we have a GFR of about 100 cc per minute. And if you have heart failure, that's, a, that's the usual thinking, there you have a problem with the filter. So let's assume you have a filter with a GFR of only 10 mLs per minute, you're still going to filter 150 grams of sodium. So the problem is not the filter, the problem is the reabsorption. As most of us are eating about four to five grams of sodium a day, the filter would be sufficient to get rid of the sodium. So it's not the filtration which is lagging behind, but it's the reabsorption which is stimulated. And that's why we have to look a little bit more in detail to the kidney, normal kidney, versus a kidney with heart failure. As you all know, you have the afferent arteriole, then you have capillaries in the glomerulus, then you have the efferent arteriole, and then again, you have capillaries next to the tubules. And the kidney is the only organ who has two capillary networks in series. Now, when you look at the glomerulus, the only thing the glomerulus wants to do is to preserve a GFR of 100 cc per minute. So if you have heart failure and a reduced renal blood flow, an increased central venous pressure, in order to maintain a GFR of 100 cc per minute, you have an increased filtration fraction. Why? If you reduce renal blood flow and you keep GFR the same, you will increase your filtration fraction. Filtration fraction is the ratio of GFR divided by renal blood flow. If this happens, it means that the blood leaving the glomerulus will have a different oncotic pressure in a heart failure patient versus a normal patient. And that's exactly what drives sodium reabsorption and water reabsorption in the proximal parts of the kidney. Because if you filter more water, there will be more proteins left in the blood leaving the glomerulus, and this will attract, this will stimulate further sodium reabsorption in the proximal parts of the kidney. And that is where heart failure, hypertension, and most of our cardiovascular disease actually arise. 
in the more proximal reabsorption of sodium in these type of patients. We go a little bit more distal at the microdensa level. The microdensa level is an endocrine organ that senses the amount of chloride. And if you have a lot of chloride, the microdensa will secrete adenosine, which will mainly give vasoconstriction to the afferent arterial. However, in heart failure, you don't have much chloride delivered to the microdensa because you reabsorb more, more in the proximal parts. And then you're not going to secrete adenosine, but you're going to secrete renin. And of course, renin is a very bad hormone. If you have decompensated heart failure, it will further stimulate the proximal sodium reabsorption. Bear in mind that if you give loop diuretics, that you actually fool the microdensa because you block the sodium chloride potassium uptake there. Therefore, the kidney thinks thinks that there's not enough chloride around. So if you give Lutrex to yourself, you're gonna increase renin levels. And then at the distal nephron, we have two hormones there which play a role, which is aldosterone and, and BMP. And both of these hormones are of course up titrated in heart failure patients, therefore promoting more sodium and water retention also in the distal parts of the kidney. Not only the kidney, which is suffering from congestion, it's also the spleen, the gut, the intestines, all these organs contribute to the problem of ongoing congestion. I'm not gonna go in detail, but we wrote, I think a very nice um, review article about that a couple of years ago, and I might suggest you to have a look at it. Also intra-abdominal pressure is important in patients with heart failure. This is a small experiment where we measured intra-abdominal pressure through a fully catheter in heart failure patients who were decompensated. And what we could see is that most of these heart failure patients have an elevated intra-abdominal pressure, which came down with decongestive therapy, but this elevated intra-abdominal pressure was also associated with a higher likelihood of worsening renal function in patients with heart failure. And finally, if you have all of that, you'll have an increased plasma volume, and then you enter the hospital with signs of symptoms of congestion. And then we give loop diuretic therapy. Loop diuretic therapy is the only therapy with a class one recommendation in our HF guidelines to treat congestion, irrespective of ejection fraction. Now, the only trial which actually looked at loop diuretic therapy was the dose trial. And those compared a low dose versus a high dose, continuous versus bolus infusion. So four different treatment strategies. And the results of those were pretty poor. Yeah. Half of the patients was either dead or rehospitalized after two months. And when you looked at the freedom from congestion after three days, it was only 15%. So only one out of six of the patients included in those was actually dry at the moment when the physician stopped the IV loop theoretic therapy. Of course, these patients had a very high chance to, re to come back to hospital because they were discharged still wet. This was a 300 patient number trial. Eh? It's a very small trial published in the Ringo Term of Medicine. It is the only randomized controlled trial we have with loop theoretic therapy. Loop directs do not really work well in patients with heart failure, especially if they are already on an oral loop diuretic, because you should be peeing out around three liters of water and sodium if you infuse yourself with 40 milligrams of furosemide, but none of our heart failure patients are actually doing that. There are many reasons for that. I'm not gonna go in detail, but I think you're all familiar with the, with the problem that a normal patient will pee out a lot of water and sodium, but a heart failure patient, especially if he has congestion and was already on an oral loop diuretic, will not do that. <clears throat> the, the, the reason for that is very clear. I explained it to you already. Most of the sodium is reabsorbed in the proximal parts of the kidney, and loop diuretics work distal from the site where most of the sodium is reabsorbed. Because many of us fail to achieve euvolemia with the utilization of loop diuretic therapy, we put forward this position document a couple of years ago within the HFA, and it is a very highly cited document. It's been downloaded almost 200,000 times, which is one of the most downloaded manuscripts ever for European Journal of Heart Failure. 
because it contains a very a lot of interesting flow charts, which are very pragmatic. And one of the, the <clears throat> one of the statements that we put in there was the door to diuretic time. This has also just been published a couple of days ago. Same same um, findings, but this is from a, this is from the Groningen group from five years ago, where they actually showed that if you wait longer, the chances that your patient will be dry will be less. So there is absolutely no time to waste. You should not wait before you administer IV loop diuretic therapy to a patient who comes into the hospital. And this is irrespective of their comorbidities or irrespective of their heart failure severity. Just give the IV loop diuretic as soon as you see a patient with congestion entering the emergency room. Now the problem of course is how much do I give and how do I have to give the drug? What we put forward here is that if your patient is loop diuretic naive, meaning he was not on an oral loop diuretic, you give 40 milligrams of furosemide IV bolus. If he's not loop diuretic naive, you give him at least once, but preferably twice the home dose. So if he was on 40 milligrams, you give him 80 milligrams IV bolus infusion. And then the question comes, what do you do next? How do you evaluate the effect of the loop diuretic? Two things. First of all, you have to assess congestion. How to do that? Well, we give you a comprehensive tool. You can look at clinical signs. You can also do technical evaluation. And if you combine the clinical and technical evaluation, it's not so difficult to detect congestion in almost all of your patients. The only problem that I'm facing are the young people, people of 30, 40 years of age. In those, it's, probably, it's, it's very difficult to detect euvolemia. But in elderly, it's not so difficult. Bear also in mind that there are different clinical profiles who might need more diuretic therapy, especially the ones with RV failure, the one with acutely complicated heart failure, they need a lot of diuretics, but the patients with acute pulmonary edema need more vasodilators. Now, coming back to the flow chart, how to evaluate the diuretic response? Well, what we put forward is that we give you two options. Either you measure urinary output, which should be at least 100 cc's per hour, but that's very difficult. It's difficult to measure urinary output because patients pee everywhere except in the buckets that you give them to collect their urine. So it's probably easier and better to collect a urine sample, send it to the lab and measure the urinary sodium content. And that should be at least 50 max per liter. We urge you to do that within hours after you give the IV loop diuretic. Why hours? Because loop diuretic therapy only works for maximum six to eight hours. So there's no reason to do it only after 24 hours. If you reached your goal, meaning you the patient is being out more than 50 max per liter, you just continue the same amount of IV loop diuretic therapy every 12 hours. If you don't reach the goal, you have to double the IV loop diuretic therapy into a maximum dose of 200 milligrams of furosemide three times daily or five milligrams of bimetanide three times daily. Why we focus so much on natriuresis, it's because if you give three consecutive days of loop diuretic therapy, monotherapy, you see the urinary volume is almost the same over three consecutive days, but the urinary sodium content is dramatically dropping. So the only moment where you get a lot of sodium out is during the first 24 hours. And that's the, really the time frame that you have to get more sodium out. <clears throat> now, what do you do the next day? If your patient reaches the goal of three to four liters a day, you just continue. If it doesn't reach the goal, you escalate loop diuretic therapy, again, until the maximum amount. And if you don't reach that, then was the option to add the second line agent, which I'll go over in a second. We are actually testing this HFA algorithm worldwide now <clears throat> in more than 27 centers. And I can already tell you that the results are spectacular. There's really a lot more patients dry and a lot more natriuresis if you use this algorithm. 
Now, what are the other options maybe in the future with regards to loop therapeutics? It might be subcutaneous furosemide. This has been demonstrated now in a small observational study just presented at HFA by the group of John McMurray, where they actually administered subcutaneous furosemide for a couple of hours. It turned out to be effective, and it also led to an increased diuresis and natriuresis. There's actually a larger randomized trial ongoing to try to show that the utilization of sub furosemide might prevent hospitalization by giving this in an outpatient setting. <clears throat> Another important problem that we're often facing is that the kidney function deteriorates during decongestive therapy. So you see a current of worsening renal function, an increase in serum creatinine or a decrease in GFR. If you see that, <clears throat> and you have a good diuretic response, meaning you're reaching the targets, then that's nothing to worry about. That is something that we call now pseudo worsening renal function, and you just continue your decongestive therapy. However, if your diuretic response is poor, you have to check for signs of hyperperfusion. Shock meaning. Shock and, a not, and an insufficient diuretic response is pretty rare. And if you see that, then you need mechanical circulatory support or inotropic agents. Most of the time, however, you do not see hyperperfusion. You just see diuretic um, resistance, and then you have to increase your diuretic intensity, and you should consider the utilization of IV vasodilators, especially in HEF-REF patients. Why in HEF-REF patients? Because these patients have a very high afterload. And afterload is determined by pressure times radius divided by wall thickness is the law of Laplace. So if you have a very large ventricle, the wall tension is really high. Adding vasodilators to such patients is extremely beneficial. We've done this by adding nitroprusside to these patients and you can actually even improve prognosis in an observational study. So vasodilators do play a role but only in decompensated have ref settings. Now, what are the second line agents you might add? So what is there to add on top of loop theoretic therapy? The first drug which most people use are thiazides. Thiazides work distal in the nephron. On itself, they have a poor diuretic effect, but they might counterbalance the distal hypertrophy that you see if you use chronically high dosages of loop diuretics. They also work on low GFR states, but they have a slow GR absorption. So that means that you have to give them hours before you give the IV loop diuretic. Bear in mind, however, that thiazides are not a safe drug to give chronically, because if you give them chronically, they are linked even after extensive propensity analysis to worse outcomes. So thiazides are only to be given temporarily. Where are the data? Well, <clears throat> Ruiz Beck da Silva has published this very nice um, prospective randomized study in 51 patients where he showed that if you add hydrochlorothiazide to patients in acute heart failure, that you, can, that you can increase the weight loss overall, but also the weight loss per milligram of rosamide. This has now also been shown in the Chlorotic trial. Chlorotic was a Spanish trial in 200 patients done uh, in, in, in Spain, presented at HFA. Basically, this more or less similar algorithm as Luis has, has showed, where they added hydrochlorothiazide, and they too showed an increase in weight loss in the patients allocated to the hydrochlorothiazide group. The paper has not been published yet. I think it's still in review somewhere. Now, what is the other option? It might be high-dose spironolactone. This has been tested in the Athena trial. Athena compared 25 versus 100 milligrams spironolactone in acute decompensated heart failure. Unfortunately, spironolactone does not lead to an increased natriuresis. It also does not lead to a more reduction in anti pearl BMP. So spironolactone is a very important agent in heart failure but it will not help you in a higher dose to decongest your patients easier. And the reason for all of that is that all these drugs were distal from the site where most of the sodium is reabsorbed. 
And basically the oldest drug that we have there is acetazolamide. And that has been tested now in the ADVOR trial. ADVOR stands for acetazolamide in the compensated heart failure with volume overload. What is acetazolamide? It's a very old agent. You give it once daily, 500 milligrams bolus infusion. It blocks carbon anhydrase and therefore it interferes with the sodium proton exchanger, which is responsible for 60%, 60% of the sodium reabsorption in the proximal parts of the kidney. We've demonstrated previously in a small uh, randomized double blind single center trial that if you add acetazolamide to, to loop diuretics, that you can almost double the fractional sodium excretion. So you can, you can get a lot more sodium out if you combine that with loop diuretics. That's why we did the ad for trial. It was a trial which took yeah, basically the preparation and then the finalization. It took more than four years, even five years to complete the trial. We, we included patients in 27 centers in Belgium. The recruitment normally was deemed to end after two years, but for obvious reasons, namely COVID, the inclusion lasted up to three years. We also did a biomarker study and since I'm also a clinician 100% of the time, me too was taking samples in the middle of the night when I was on call to collect for the biobank. We had a budget of 2.2 million euros, so that's too much to ask for somebody. So we went to the healthcare government in Belgium and luckily they gave us the trust and the money to do the trial. There was zero, absolutely zero interest of any pharmaceutical company. So this is a really an academic trial investigator initiated. So what was the trial? It was a prospective multi-center, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled academic trial without any industry funding. It was a very pragmatic trial where we included patients with acute decompensated heart failure who entered the hospital with at least one sign of clinical volume overload, meaning edema, pleural effusion, and oracitis. If these patients had pleural effusion or oracitis, this needed to be confirmed by a technical exam by the investigator to absolutely make sure there was additional volume. Patients needed to be at least one month on oral loop diuretics and their nt B should have been above 1,000. We calculated that we would need 519 patients to detect an absolute risk reduction of 10%. That's a lot, eh? Absolute risk reduction, 10%. This means a relative risk reduction of 66%. So we were really ambitious, really ambitious. We thought that the control group would have a decongestion rate of 15% because the control group is the same as for as protocol as has been used in the dose trial. So we uh, asked investigators to fill in this congestion score on a daily basis, constructed of edema, pleural effusion, and ascites. Patients were deemed to be dry if they have the score of less or equal to one. The trial was really simple. Two strategies. One, the, the one strategy was double the home dose of thorosamide with bimetanide plus placebo during three days. The other one, one was similar amount of loop diuretics, so twice the home dose plus once daily 500 milligrams of acetazolamide. The primary endpoint was, is your patient dry after three days of decongestive therapy? That's the primary endpoint. And that is the class one recommendation in the HFA guidelines. So it's a very important clinically relevant endpoint. When we looked at the basic characteristics of the patients that we included, these were well-matched patients who were elderly. Average age was 78, 78. Ejection fraction, 43%. Two thirds that have PEF, one third that have REF. Median anti pro BNP, 6,200. So elderly, sick patients, comparable to what we're seeing every day, all of these patients have a lot of comorbidities. GFRs were around 38. So sick patients, the ones that are flooding the emergency rooms in Europe. This is actually what we're seeing. This is really a pragmatic trial. When we looked at the congestion score, median was five. So these were really wet patients. They all had enema on the legs. 
60% have pleural effusion, and about 10% also have ascites. When we compared at four with the other aforementioned diuretic trials, DOSE was loop diuretics, Athena spironolactone, Caress was ultrafiltration versus a stepwise uh, diuretic approach. You could see that our patients were older, reflecting of a pragmatic trial. That's what we're seeing now, nowadays. More retreated with MRAs at baseline, and their anti pro BMPs were considerably higher than in the, all the other trials. Primary endpoint, again, decongestion within three days. In the placebo group, 30%. We estimated it to be 15%, but it was higher. But in the acetazolamide group, it was 42%. It was a huge win for acetazolamide. 46% more dry if you add 500 milligrams of acetazolamide during three days. Impressive results. The first trial in acute heart failure with a positive clinical relevant endpoint. You might wonder, does it work better in some type of patients? The answer is no. It works all over the board. The lines are all on the right side, no matter if you're older, lower, higher ejection fraction, lower, higher anti-pro BMP, the drug was extremely effective in all subgroups. And then you can think, you know, I don't use acetazolamide, I use something else and I make it up at discharge. I'll make sure my patients are dry at discharge. This is what our investigators did. So after three days, we stopped the, the, the drug and then they could do whatever they want to try to decongest their patients better. They reached euvolemia in 62% of the patients at discharge. However, with azetazolamide, it was almost 80%. Relative risk reduction, 27%. Number needed to treat six. It means you cannot make up what you lost initially. The reason for that is that azetazolamide has an incremental benefit over consecutive days. And what the drug actually does, it prevents further loop diuretic resistance. So if you don't give it, you'll develop more loop diuretic resistance, therefore having a lower likelihood that your patient will become dry after decongestive therapy. The drug works really well on natriuresis. You increase natriuresis a lot more than diuresis, and this is really important because this is the culprit of the problem acutely compensated heart failure. Secondary endpoints, we reduced length of stay with more than one day, which is also clinically important. Patients are lo less long hospitalized, which also will have a benefit on quality of life and will have a reduction in healthcare related costs. We did not reduce all cost mortality and re hospitalization because the trial was of course under power to do so. And also I do not believe that a short-term acting agent will translate in long-term prognosis. Also bear in mind that the risk was only 28% at three months, while it was up to 50% in a similar patient population and dose. This is reflective, I think, or we think, that most of the patients were dry at the moment of discharge. When we looked at SARS, there was no influence of SARS on the primary endpoints. Both patients before and after the pandemic were equally dry with the addition of azetazolamide. Both groups received the same amount of loop theoretic therapy, so you cannot say that the cytosolomite patients received more loop theoretic therapy. It was absolutely similar between the two groups. Was there a problem with safety? No, there was not. There was no increase in renal endpoints. There was no increase in hypokalemia or metabolic acidosis, and there was also no increase in hypotension. Bear in mind that the drug has been used for more than 70 years so I think it has shown a safety profile over the last seven decades. Now, you might wonder, you know, there's another agent that works proximal, which are the STLD2 inhibitors. Well, STLD2 inhibitors, they block sodium glucose uptake, but that is responsible for only 5% of the sodium uptake. And what I told you before is that the Zolomite is responsible for 60% of the sodium uptake. So they were completely different and if anything, they might work synergistically. But SGLD2 inhibitors will not help you to decongest patients better, especially if you give them on the long run, because these are not used 
as diuretic agents. They give some, they give osmotic uh, diuresis that has been shown in many trials, but in the long run, they will not help you to decongest patients better. So these were our conclusions. Adfer was the largest diuretic trial in acute heart failure ever performed with a very important clinical endpoint. We showed that the addition of one daily acetazolamide intravenously was associated with a 46% higher incidence of successful decongestion. The benefit was consistent across all pre-specified subgroups and patients treated with acetazolamide had more natriuresis or shorter hospital stay and were more likely to be discharged without volume overload. The number needed to treat was only six. There was no reduction in all-cause death and heart failure hospitalization, but again, the trial was underpowered to do so. There was no higher incident of adverse events. And I think the results highlight the importance that we have to target congestion early and aggressively. And they also support the use of natriuresis as an indicator of diuretic response. And we feel that the trial supports the utilization of this drug as it is a cheap drug it's off patent, it's very easy to use, safe, and very effective to improve decongestion. So if you think about the guidelines with, that, with regards to diuretic therapy, we know that loop diuretics have a class one recommendation, although they're actually lacking the data. And we also know that thiazides have a class two A recommendation. And then you have to wonder what's gonna happen with the cetazolamide. There's of course nothing in the guidelines yet, but this is something that we might think the guideline company might phrase it, but I'm not part of that. But we think it might be phrased as this. Acetazolamide on top of loop diuretics is recommended for patients with acute heart failure who are admitted with signs of fluid overload who were previously treated with oral loop diuretics to improve the incidence of decongestion. The class B, since we have one randomized controlled trial, and then it's one or two A, depending on how the guideline committee will decide on that. The, Trial has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is, I think we're really proud of that, of course. But that also means that it's very important um, to change the way we're treating acute heart failure. Finally, two slides about loop theoretic withdrawal. This is also a very important topic. More than 80% of my heart failure patients ambulatory are not on loop theoretics anymore. What is the key? What are the, the keys to withdraw your loop theoretic therapy? First of all, there's no guidance in the guidelines, but I think there are some conditions for successful down titration. First of all, put your patients on, on guideline recommended medical therapy. Put those patients, especially with head breath, on your quadruple therapy. If your patient is compliant, if you don't see any residual congestion clinically, if they have a more or less normal RV function or a normal VCI or normal diastolic function, then it's feasible to down titrate and even stop the loop diuretics. I think that's what we're doing daily. Again, 80% of my heart failure patients are not on loop diuretics anymore. However, if you have a patient who still has a little bit of congestion or has a poor RV function and you think you cannot stop the diuretic, you should not stop it. This is exactly what we have been looking at. This is a trial where we stopped the loop diuretic in ambulatory patients in which we felt we could not stop it. And what you could see is immediately already the day after, you see a spectacular reduction in natriuresis. So you should not stop the loop diuretic in a patient in which you feel you cannot stop it. Because if you do that, they'll have a decrease in natriuresis already the day, the day after you stopped it. This is my final slide. I think at first shows us that we have, there is a new paradigm shift for acute heart failure, which should be called door to combo diuretic time. And I know that Dr. Da Silva might not agree with me, but I think based on the evidence that we're having now, it should be a loop diuretic therapy plus acetazolamide. I thank you for your attention. I'm open for any questions. So thanks a lot. I guess we should start with the ideas of Professor Vector Silva. Thank you very much for the nice invitation to take part of this uh, talk. It's a great pleasure to be with uh, these three gentlemen and very honored people here. Uh, it's my pleasure. And regarding the, the talk from Dr. Mullins, it's just a great pleasure to listen to you. 
and most of your uh, papers uh, we have been read and used uh, in our practice. Uh, even the one in uh, nitroprusside is is very very much cited uh, in our rounds uh, almost every day in the ICU up to now. Uh, I would say nitroprusside is the most used vasodilator in our center at the moment uh, for acute heart failure patients. And you believe in it? You see it working? Oh, very much. Good. Yes. yes. Because yes. most people in Europe don't use it anymore. They don't believe in it. They all give levosimen then, but they should be giving oh. nitroprusside more. Yeah. No, we, we have actually a nitroprusside protocol Mm -hmm. And we just tell the nurse to use it as, as the protocol, and the patient starts to to die raised, uh, yeah. like crazy. Yes, we have the yes. same experience. It's good that you yeah. mentioned it again. Yeah. Yes, and we for the new students that come over, we start citing your your paper. I think it's not so important that you cite my paper, but it's more important that you teach them that they should be using nitroprusside. So that's oh, I I do place. both. I do both. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, regarding diuretics, uh, it's uh, it's very nice to to hear this field going on. Uh, I, I I don't disagree with the use of acetazolamide. I, I believe the uh, the two the, the diuretic that is more there's more data right now is acetazolamide to 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 use on the patients. Uh, I think we we do need more data in other diuretics. Maybe we'll have more in the future. Uh, I would say uh, we should use it. Uh, the question we we are facing right now, I believe in many countries, is that we don't have the IV formulation. Uh, at least in Brazil, we use we are we are starting to use orally. Mm -hmm. But then again, it's not the perfect uh, match with the data at the study. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, th I think it's it's correct what you're saying. Many many people are telling me the same story that they don't have access to the IV formularium. Now, I think I think it will be possible to actually order it somewhere abroad, and if the if the demand is high enough, it's an off patent agent. So basically, every company can make it. There's an indication for heart failure. So that's the first remark. I think it will be, I hope it will be available worldwide soon. The second thing about the oral formularium, from an anecdotal experience, I think it works as well, but I cannot say that open and officially because we've never tested that just like you alluded to. And there might be a problem with the oral absorption of the drug, just like there is with furosemide or with thiazides. We don't know about the pharmacokinetics if you give a drug orally, especially if you have gut edema. But from an anecdotal experience, I think it worked. We feel it works as well. And then we give 250 milligrams once daily. Just a word of caution I would not give acetazolamide in an ambulatory phase outpatient for more than a couple of days. We don't have any data with regards to iron disturbances, just like with thiazides. We know that thiazides do harm on the long term, probably not on the short term if you control the, the ions really uh, regularly. But with the zetazolamide, it's the same. So you can give it for a couple of days, and then once your patient is decongested, you have to stop it again. Yeah, I agree. Uh, even thiazides, when we use in the ambulatory patients, we we tell them to use for a week or two yeah. at the most, and then stop it. Yeah. So yeah. we. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's a very important point again that that we that we also teach the people who are listening. Diuretics are a dynamic drug. Diuretics are never a one dose fits all or fits long term. This has also been shown by all the CardiMEMS data, the pressure sensors in the pulmonic artery. The only change they did was dynamic changes in loop diuretic therapy. And that's what we should be doing. Diuretics are to decongest patients and all the other drugs are to actually prevent hospitalizations. And that's now been mistaken by many people. Diuretics are just to decongest, to take away the volume overload but that is important in the acute phase. And once the volume is away, we should up titrate the neuromonal blockers to prevent the reappearance of the volume. Yeah. Uh, one one uh, anecdotal story that we have here is that our patients are already taking thiazides at the hospital. 
uh, that we use it uh, mainly for those patients who have diuretic resistance. And, and nowadays, after your study, you, we are putting acetazolamide oral on top of it. Mm -hmm. And and we are seeing uh, uh, immediate results, like in the next day. But of course, there's a, uh, there's no data whatsoever for mm -hmm. those three drugs together, no. uh, and a short period of time, like a few few mm -hmm. days. Yeah, I think uh, you're right. I mean, we don't have data. What we didn't try, we actually stopped the ties as in ad four because we did not want to confound the two arms. So we want the same amount. And we could not predict, of course, how many people would be on TISA. So we stopped the TISA when patients came into the hospital. And in Belgium, was like I think it was like 15% of the patients that were entering the trial were on TISA because of hypertension. Because it's often put in, in a combination with another drug to treat hypertension. It's not so much used as a diuretic agent. But I, I think it, also it... For me, it doesn't really matter that much how you decongest the patient, as long as you decongest them well before you discharge them. And this is just a trial which is very simple, which was using a very simple algorithm, twice daily loop diuretics, which is even not enough if you look at the guidelines, because the guidelines tell you to check more often, to change more often, but that's what 95% of the people are doing, because most of the heart failure patients are not, are not admitted in heart failure wards, they're admitted in just general cardiology wards or internal medicine ward, geriatrics, and there people just give once or twice daily diuretics. And this is a trial which compared that strategy with a strategy where you add the second line agent, the cetazolamide. So this, I think the HFA algorithm is a lot better even than ad 4 if I'm really honest, where you actually pay close attention. But if you add for a trial, which is probably which might be able to change the practice of everybody's giving loop diuretics tomorrow to make it better. That's correct. And I have a question for you to take advantage of this, this time. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the, the salt restriction in your study and, and in your practice? Yeah, yeah, good question. The salt restriction in the study was just an advice where we said, you know, try to cut down on the sodium intake, just like what's still written in acute heart failure, in the heart failure guidelines. In my practice, we do the same for acute heart failure. So we suggest in the hospitalization that they don't eat too much sodium, but you cannot really check that. In the ambulatory phase, I'm less strict on that. I think there are also more and more data appearing that although we say that we, they should be strict, people are not doing that. They still eat. 10 or 12 grams of sodium chloride every day, so they don't do what we're saying. And that there are also data that suggest even harm because you increase the normal stimulation. So for acute heart failure, I still feel there probably is a benefit, uh, but for chronic heart failure, we're really less strict than what we used to be 10 years ago. But I don't know yeah. what the neurologists think about that sodium restriction. Marcus, do you have any comments on sodium restriction as a nephrologist? Yes, I have some some comments and questions. So first, I must admit also, like Professor Da Silva, that I'm, I'm, I want to thank you because for more than a decade you inspired my clinical practice, and it came down till to it boiled down to down to acute kidney injury. Does pre renal really exist, and and all these kind of things that you did. And and that's funny because um, it's a uh, yeah was was fruitful from the side of the cardiology. Um, I, I, maybe for me and the audience it, about the basic thinking of of you cardiologists uh, um, dealing with the heart failure patients, and um, I think also our CKD patients are more or less heart failure patients. Mm -hmm. um, we learned, so to say, in school that that water homeostasis and sodium homeostasis, although interrelated, are also disconnected by via different regulatory mechanisms. And then we look now, in the very recent years, in the dialysis um, literature, we see that obviously not the sodium that's the problem, but it's the the fluid overload, the water per se. So, in what is the center now in in what what in your aiming? Um, do you want to have um, a depletion of sodium, so to say, more or less rapidly in 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 your patients, or is it the the pure fluid? And in this regard, why did Dolbabdan failed in the heart failure patients? 
do we need uh, because you also mentioned Jens Tietz uh, um, a, a sodium so to say depletion yeah I, I think if I'm honest I don't know we don't know we, we know that also sodium and water is closely linked if you give diuretic therapy but we have the feeling that we have to I mean, what we're actually doing is we're treating extra vascular volume overload, extracellular volume overload with diuretic therapy. That's what we're doing. And it seems that agents that led to more excretion of sodium actually lead to better or more effective decongestive strategy. Wherever, if you look at the SGLT2, and I don't have to explain to you, they don't excrete sodium, they excrete more water, and they translate to really improved long-term outcomes. But if you use an SGLT2 on top of loop diuretics, you almost don't gain anything with regards to decongestion. Well, if you add a thiazide or if you add acetazolamide, you can decongest these patients a lot more easier. So that, that also makes me think that we have to get the sodium out in order to decongest the patients. But on the long term, I don't think we have any clue. That is why I put this, this Titsa thought be forward because just hopefully to inspire some young people because I've been telling that over and over now to the cardiology community, you know, there are sodium stores. It's not so simple as we think. You eat it and you pee it out. It doesn't exist. So we don't know what's happening. And the same is true for chloride. I mean, the main center, I don't have to explain to you, of course, as being a neurologist, the main center in the kidney is not sodium, it's chloride. And nobody pays attention to chloride. Well, when we did the sub-analysis of emphasis, we could show that low chloride levels are a lot more important than low sodium levels. So we don't have a clue, basically. We just, but our gut feeling is that if you use diuretics, which are just osmotic working agents, like SGLT2, or uh, like you were alluding to the Vaptans, that doesn't really lead to, be to better improved outcomes. Plus, these drugs fail to achieve um, uh, sufficient decongestion. And the, all the VAPTAN studies we've used, it's, I, mean, I used to use it when I was still in the US, don't really lead to decongestion if you give them. They're really expensive. So, but I don't really know the, the exact answer to that. Would you know it, Luis? Do you think differently? Uh, oh, of course I don't know, but I, I have my thoughts on that. Okay. Uh, I, I think uh, we we should tell patients to avoid sodium when we are talking about hypertension risk and, and cardiovascular risk as in, in general. I believe sodium has to be restricted in communities as, as the, the study from the from China and uh, mm -hmm. sponsored by Australian author has shown that if you if you take a, a low salt preparate low sodium preparation of salt for communities, uh, it prevented uh, strokes, and I, I believe in that. It was plus potassium. Right. Yeah. When we go to the heart failure part of the continuum of cardiovascular disease, I think this this uh, uh, there is a switch, because uh, in, in the contemporary treatment of heart failure, that you actually are blocking neurohormonal pathways. Uh, uh, sodium restriction may be a bad thing because then you are uh, activating uh, running angiotensin systems. And then maybe you would even need some amount of salt, not excessive salt, but you may need not to restrict. You, you may need some salt in order to uh, put your systems resting and then you take the current medication that will block uh, the, the, the system, uh, renin angiotensin system, adrenergic systems, and naturally active peptide systems. So uh, as far as the patient is well treated, I think we should not restrict salt of them. And, and this may be uh, valid for acute and chronic patients. But of course, these are speculations based on what we know so far. We are, don't have completely proof uh, of this. Uh, uh... But I think, I think you're, you're pointing at the right direction. We know from the hypertension literature, of course, that there are patients who are really successful, susceptible to higher salt intake. And these patients are also very, these are patients, 
that, that can be treated really well with MRAs, for example, eh? if they have more yeah. hyperaldosteronism. Eh? So the study in the lens a couple of years ago where they measured the, the renin yeah. level, and you could see easily that the ones with hyperaldosterone were erect really well to a low dose MRA. So there are yeah. some sensitive people in hypertension, and probably also in heart failure. An acute heart failure might just be one of the moments where they're really salt sensitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we, I think we don't know it yet. And, I mean, and the, plus, yeah. plus the problem of thirst that patients may get, uh, and plus uh, the caloric intake too. We we have shown in a paper that uh, the the main author was a nutritionist, a dietitian. So she was very much curious and careful about collecting data on the calories that patients would be taking when they do salt restrictions. And there was a significant uh, uh, decrease uh, in the protein and caloric intake on those heart failure patients that that uh, uh, was uh, recommended salt restriction. So this is another uh, drawback of uh, prescribing salt restriction too. And, and many times patients with heart failure, they are uh, under uh, they are under nutrition uh, malnourished yeah. and, and they are weak and they need some calories too and with water intake eh, there's also the problem that if you think about you again you being a nephrologist it we always pee out hypotonic urine so it means if we're eating five six seven grams of sodium we're not drinking enough eh? if you're re restricting our heart patients to drink and they still eat the same amount of sodium like you and I are doing, they cannot even get rid of their sodium. So I think uh -huh. even the fluid intake restriction is even more problematic than telling to everybody they cannot eat sodium. Because uh -huh. if they still eat sodium and they don't drink, they can't even get rid of their, their sodium. Because yeah, and especially, yeah, and especially if they must eat a certain amount of osmolites, such yeah. as protein, that they don't get the wasting they need the water to, to get rid of the osmolites. But maybe interestingly, we have preliminary data. We looked at different forms of nutrition, high carb, low carb, keto, and looked with a seven Tesla MRA at the uh, um, like, like Jens Tietze did it in the sodium stores, and we saw tremendous differences um, when they were eating a, a low carb or ketogenic diet, for example. So, and, and this also corresponds to the diuresis of the patient, so they get more rid of free water clearance. And, and these are factors that are not uh, accounted for in the patients. They'll sit in the hospital and eat 200 grams of spaghetti, and we we don't measure that, yeah. Mm -hmm. This has maybe also a reason. Um, maybe coming back to your paper, um, I mean, you already mentioned that SGLT tools uh, were not included, but would you nowadays recommend the combination of both of them in the acutely compensated yeah. heart failure? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we excluded them because we started the trial in, in 2016 when there were absolutely zero data available with regards to SGLT2 and heart failure. We already had the suspicion at that moment that they would be beneficial for heart failure. There were some reviews coming out, but uh, we didn't want to include them because there was no indication at that moment in time. So we couldn't even prescribe them. And we wanted to avoid a disbalance in both groups. Um, but nowadays, I think it's absolutely imperative that we give SGLT2s to everybody with heart failure, acute, chronic, I mean, this should be a first line agent, no matter, there is absolutely zero doubt in the mind that we should be adding these drugs. But again, it's not an acute heart failure drug that will decongest. It's an acute heart failure drug that will improve prognosis, which is really important, but our patients are not coming in to tell them, to tell us, you know, I want a better prognosis. They come in with all the water and the sodium excesses. I want to get rid of the fluid because I cannot breathe. And for that part, the diuretics are there. And again, people are confusing that all the time nowadays. They're saying, should I admit the patient with acute decompensated heart failure? I should just give them the quadruple therapy and they will do fine. Yeah, but they're complaining of this excess of water and sodium. And that's why Lewis and, his, and myself are doing diuretic trials to solve that problem. So SGLT2 is yes in everybody, chronic, absolutely in combination with loop diuretics and acetazolamides and maybe thiazide. So you would start on day one when they admitted you yeah. would not go for a three-day course of acetazolamide, but you would start them at the very absolutely. same day of admission. Yeah, yeah. There, if you ask for a safety issue, there is absolutely no safety problem. 
Um, so I would add that day one, I mean, amples now are shown that if you give it early on that you already see some results after a couple of weeks. And if you see the SLT2 curves, they, they separate really early on. So I would not wait a single day by adding them. And your patients were cardiorenal patients, essentially with 38, 39 milliliters yeah. per minute. Uh, how low would you go? Um, for the STLT2? If we, no, no, for the acetazolamide, for the GFR. Uh, so we excluded GFR below 20, but there is no reason to believe that it will be toxic if you, if you go lower. But for the trial, we did 20. But it, it's because, also protein-bound drug, so I don't think there will, you will do harm. Because man, many, many patients come to the emergency when they have CKD stage 4 or 5 and... Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, are fluid okay. loaded. I, I would probably go until you think you need dialysis. Mm -hmm. This is a short acti acting age. And if, if you give it to a GFR of 15, that's what we're also doing now in current practice. We don't see problems. Again, we are not going to give the drug for weeks and weeks. That's a couple of days. And do you think this is worth also for ISL2 inhibitors? The, for, the... Yeah, yeah, I think we, we, we yeah, there are. Uh, Perhaps the nephrologist should answer this question, but we also give we give we give it up to a GFR of ten. But that, I mean that's off that's off label. Eh? Again on YouTube, yes. this is off label. It's not on label. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. not saying this, but in practice we give it to. I mean there are studies now ongoing for dialysis even eh? that it might improve yeah. the prognosis of dialysis. The the thing is, does it do harm if you give it with a poor GFR? And so far nobody has shown harm if you give ten milligrams. I mean, you have to, sorry, but you have to warn the patients uh, because they do it off label. I had a patient with, I don't know, 12, 13 GFR, and then she had six. So um, it works, obviously, um, but you have to tell them. Yeah, I think we had a, I had a problem last week. So I prescribed an RNA and an SGL2, again, off label, not for YouTube. So I prescribed in a half ref patient. I changed them from RB to RNA. And it changed him from a very bad diabetic drug to an SGLT2, both off label. And I get a phone call from the pharmacist. I'm not going to give these drugs because these are toxic for your patients. <laughs> they, have, they have ref, injection fraction 20%, GFR 35. Come on, it's not reimbursed in Belgium. I, can, that's a, I didn't even, I mean, it's just a prescription. I refuse to give it. So you have to fight with everybody. Yeah. But off label huh? again. And what, what do you mean? Because we had Rajiv Agarwal here with fabulous data and CKD patients with Um Could this have a role as a very strong fire size, so to say? I think, uh, Luis, you should tackle that question. So in Europe, we use more chlorotalidone than hydrochlorothiazide. It's nothing is exactly the same but it's the ties that, that most of us use here in, in europe well uh, we usually do not use on acute heart failure patients but mainly because it's not available in our in our hospitals here we do use a lot of chlorotalidone for for ambulatory patients as a as an antihypertensive drug yes even as yeah. the first line uh uh, even combined with amyl amyloride and mm -hmm. chlorotalidone, but uh, not actually in heart failure patients because uh, hydrochlorothiazide is the thiazide that we have available for that. But I believe should be the same. Okay. We use it sometimes if, if we don't get there with the cetazolamide and loop teratics, then we use it in acute heart failure. We don't really have the hydrochlorothiazide there. We use more the chlorotalidone. But again, it's 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 significantly less since we're target since we're escalating our diuretic therapy sooner and since we're adding acetazolamide. But it's also I think the phenotype of the patients entering our hospitals in Belgium are different from ten years ago. Ten years ago, we used to see on a daily basis people coming in with 10, 15 kilograms of volume overload. That more or less has disappeared because we have identified the heart failure patients in our regions. The physicians are better trained. The family members are better trained. So we see less patients who come in with grossly volume overload than 10 years ago. More so cardiorenal syndrome. More yeah, cardiorenal syndrome. You also see it in the, in the pragmatic trial. The average age is 78. They're 
elderly, sick patients with a lot of comorbidities. It's different from 10 years ago. Yes. So apparently you don't like thiazides too much and you pointed to the elevated mortality in some cohort studies. Does this skepticism also refer to hypertension or is this strictly really focused upon heart failure patients? Yeah, I think it's more focused on heart failure. So when you use it as a heart failure drug to prevent uh, decompensation, th there's where the data come from. Not so much for the hypertension. I think for the hypertension, they use really low dosages. And there it's a, it's even a class one recommended therapy. So I'm not going to say that you should not use it for hypertension. But since hypertension, CKD, heart failure are really closely related, I think we all know hundreds of patients that we see ambulatory where you do a blood test where they have a low sodium or a low potassium and then you look at the medication and it's a lot of the times it's a thiazide so mm -hmm. i'm not really a fan of thiazides even in hypertension but mm -hmm. again off label i think there are agents that probably are better if you phenotype your patient better if you look at the HIVET study which is a study in hypertension elderly people it's ace inhibition Dramatic reduction in mortality in really elderly people. So, ACE inhibition is a very good drug if you have hypertension. And if you then combine it with a second line agent, fine. But again, it's also because it's a matter of cost. Worldwide, thiazides are extremely cheap to treat hypertension really effectively. But in countries like Belgium, Germany, probably Brazil, and most people, when you have the option, knowing that you have so much disturbances with sodium, potassium, I'm not the biggest fan of thiazides, no. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you think as nephrologists. Do you, do you use it a lot in Germany for hypertension? Yeah. In Austria, a lot. Um, but we try to eliminate a lot of it because we have many, many patients, older patients and older women uh, with hyponatremia. And it, I think it costs a lot, the, the health system. We always get them from the surgery department because they have a hip fracture. And then we see hyponatremia for years in several admission reports. And so I think it's a, a problem. And the other thing is, I also believe that it increases insulin resistance and other sequelae that I don't like. Yeah. And we have the issue on skin cancer that has been raised by Dr. Podogat whom we also once had here on Markus at Home, and uh, which led finally in what we call in Germany Rote Handbrief, so black box warning actually. So we are taught to really inform our patients that if we go with uh, HCT, we have to inform them that there's an increase in skin cancer that may at least be seen in, in large cohort studies. I have one final question on the study uh, because Advo has been discussed on NephroJC, which is arguably the most important podcast in nephrology. And everybody was really thrilled by the study. But there came one question by several uh, people who participated, and they all asked, you have this standardized volume treatment with mag magnesium. Is this kind of standard in your hospitals, or why did you go for magnesium infusions in uh, your yeah. patients? Uh it's not really standardized, but we, we ask all the investigators in the different centers, do you have a protocol for the background fluids? And some said, I don't give fluids. Some said, I give a lot of fluids. So many said, yeah, I used to give magnesium to prevent cramps, cramps in the legs. I don't know if it works to prevent cramps, but that's what many of us have been taught in the university hospitals. And then you take over what you've been taught. So we had to come to a yeah, an agreement. So we recommended if you give something, give that. But there, we didn't force them to do that. So it's more as a preventive strategy against cramps, although the, I don't think there are any data to support that. Did you have more cramps in the in the trial? We didn't we didn't measure cramps, to be very honest, Louise. But yeah, I think we all know it. You know, if you give a lot of diuretics that people complain about cramps in their legs. And then in Belgium, it seems to be a custom that, that we then give magnesium. So that's why we added it preventively. If they would give an infusion, do that. But it's more as an agreement that it wasn't really pre-specified that they had to do this. Okay. I have one more nephrological 
question. Some years ago, there was much discussion about all these different devices for ultrafiltration. The studies have not really convinced us. Um, as you are really the leader on the field, do you think that the idea of mechanical ultrafiltration will come back in the next years? Yeah. We, I used to do it a lot 10, 15 years ago, really a lot, but never as fast as an unload. And the unload was the first trial in Jack where they said, you know, 500 cc's per hour, but that's too fast. I mean, we're not in a nephrologist where we have to take out everything in four hours. I think if you do it 100, 200 cc's per hour with the close monitoring of the blood pressure, there it might be of value. But again, since we don't have the patients coming in with 10 kilograms anymore, we don't need it as much anymore. But if you really had like the cardiorenal problem, patients with 10, 20 kilograms of volume excess, they're not peeing in those patients where you used to do it. But now with nipride, with all the diuretic agents, with a closer look, I don't use it that much anymore. It's the same in the US. The, the, the utilization is going down. I don't think that it's only because of the studies which were neutral. It is also more to do with the better clinical practice of better titration of diuretic therapy. Do you use it, Luis, in Brazil? No, not really the ultrafiltration itself. Uh, we end up using when the patient is going through dialysis and then the nephrologists decide if they really need only ultrafiltration or, or, or if they really need dialysis, but not as a specific device, no. Hmm. And, I, and I agree with you, maybe also we don't need as much uh, as we needed in the past. Uh, yeah. And we, we use a lot of vasodilators, uh, IV in the acute setting, and and they really seems to work out. Yeah. You know, the, the vasodilators, they have been fallen out of, of yeah, how do you say it? Most people don't use it anymore after all the neutral trials, but we're clinicians, you know, we have to individualize. And it's very difficult in acute heart failure to have a positive effect. That's why we're sort of happy with ad for. It must be an overwhelming positive effect because there are so much differences in phenotypes of patients coming in. And especially in the phase of the later observational or prospective trials, you have to pick the right patients, which are the ones with half ref decompensated, the cold and wet patients, that's what we <coughs> used to call them. Low output, high filling pressures, big ventricles. Those are the ones who benefit most. Yeah. And even the, the more hypotensive ones, it, it seems to do even better. Absolutely. Yeah. It's the vasodilator. Yeah. We see the blood pressure going up yeah. Yeah. when Absolutely. we give them vasodilators. And, and this is the part of the, that many people don't get it. But yeah. uh, I. Yeah, it's decreasing the afterload. Therefore, you improve the forward flow. I mean, that concept, it's the basic concept of of half ref that's how everything started with heart players phase of that yes. yeah yes okay so maybe as last question we are close to the aha meeting american heart association and if i'm correctly informed we will see some sub studies from adverse surely this is under embargo and you cannot tell us the results but maybe you can give us some ideas what will be presented at the meeting and there will be one or two other diuretic studies also presenting so what can we see yeah. in the next days or weeks to come i think what i'm looking forward to because the adverse subsidies i know it's <laughs> It's transformed. It's the largest trial with diuretic therapy in ambulatory patients. So that's going to be presented, I think, by Stefan Green. It's Ampa Kidney, of which we already know the, the results, but I think that's going to be also a very interesting trial. And at four, we'll have two major sub-analysis. It's the one on ejection fraction. And so does the drug, is, is it equally effective uh, across all the ejection fraction stages? And the second one is on natriuresis. What does naturesis tells us about the effects of acetazolamide prognosis? And I think both of them are yeah, really interesting. We'll see. So we're looking forward to reading or watching your yeah. presentation. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for doing this study because it's so difficult really to do such kind of studies outside the industry world and outside the funded study world. So uh, have a nice stay at the AHA. Thanks again for being with us tonight. Thank you.